Welcome to the 36th edition of Podcasters today with Martin Redstone. Martin, welcome. Hey, John. Thanks for having me and congrats on 36 episodes. That's amazing. Ah, and, uh, and it happens to be you, right? Absolutely. Lucky number 36. Yeah, yeah. That's your age, right? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> oh, I wish. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, uh, well, we know your name, but what you're doing. Yeah, and... sure. So thanks. So as you said, Martin Redstone, um, I, I have two sides to, to, to my life when it comes to my, uh, my professional life anyway. Um, the first one uh, is Bot Jobs, which is um, the largest job board and career site for any conversational AI jobs, um, whether that be permanent freelancer, um, trying to connect the best kind of conversational AI talent with the best opportunities out there, basically. Um, and the other side of my life is I have been running for several years a consulting business called PeopleBots, which is PPL Bots. It's trying to kind of be hip with the youth and acronyms and all that kind of thing. Um, and that is a specialist uh, conversational AI consultancy that works with uh, recruitment and HR teams and how to get the most out of uh, conversational AI. So basically, you, all your attention is focused on the HR um, uh, business. Yes. So, so everything I do, whether it be um, on the bot job side or the people bot side, is all about recruitment and HR, um, ultimately. Yeah. So uh, I suppose just to give you a background to that, um, I, I know you're probably asking this question anyway, so I'm going to jump in. So I, I've, been, um, I've been in the recruitment industry for 18 years now um, and started off life. As a, as a recruiter, um, as most people do in the industry, but very quickly moved on to um, designing recruitment solutions and then from there moving on to how we can innovate and improve recruitment using technology. Um, and then uh, about seven years ago, accidentally fell into the world of conversational AI and haven't looked back since really. And what made you, what attracted you in the conversational AI? Because there's something there and everybody, the, the, there's a, the red line with everybody, that, that's the same, but, but it's a different, in a different context. I, I can't really explain, but you know. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those things, isn't it? That like, like to kind of accidentally fell into it. And I think most people tend to, it's the same with recruitment as well. Nobody stands up in their, in their primary school and you know, the line of children say, I want to be a fireman, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be a recruiter. And it's the same thing with, uh, you know, no, no, no kid's going to stand up, well, hopefully soon, but no kids at the minute are standing up and saying, oh, I want to be a conversation designer. Um, we'll have to change that, definitely. But um, how it happened for me was um, I was running a, a large recruitment project uh, for, a, uh, for a central government organization here in the UK. Um, and there was a lot of resource required and they, and they wanted to throw people at it. And I'm sitting there going, no, 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 there's got to be a better way of doing this. Technology is going to have to be involved here because you just, you need to automate some of this. And at the time, seven years ago, there wasn't really anything around in the world of kind of recruitment chatbots and recruitment conversational AI. And there were some businesses that were just starting to be built and technology was starting to be built, but nothing that was really there. So I, I kept in touch with um, some of those vendors and kept an eye on some of those vendors. Uh, and one of them um, was ready to launch about six months after that um, and go to market. And I ended up getting involved um, with that, that vendor, that, that recruitment chatbot vendor, um, and um, led them as their um, sales director for, for EMEA, for Europe, Middle East and Africa. Um, and, um, and I was there for a couple of years. But while I was there, um, really kind of fell in love with, with the whole concept and theory around conversational AI. Look, before I was in recruitment, I was an engineer. I'm a computer science graduate. So for me, I, I, I find technology wonderful um, and, um, and, and scary sometimes, but absolutely wonderful in, in the power that it can bring. And one of my biggest interests was human computer interaction. So for me, I was just fascinated with this whole world of, at the time, chatbots, because nobody really said conversational AI seven years ago. Um, but I was fascinated with how, if done properly, the, the way that you can ask users, whether they be customers, whether they be job seekers, to interact with you as an organization could be fantastic. The experience could be incredible. Um, and you could solve so many problems in recruitment using that technology. So I really fell in love with it. Um, I was there for two years. The technology worked really well, but, but it was very limited in terms of um, 
um, it was very much a decision tree based chatbot um, technology. And so when I left there and kind of started digging deeper into this kind of wider world and getting involved in, you know, in more technology and the communities that are out there, I was just mind blown around conversational AI, as we can call it now. So, so um, I started digging deeper, learning more, getting involved in things. And, and, and my journey has been just superb in the last five years that I've been doing that. Um, I've been, I've been very, very lucky to be involved in some fantastic communities, some fantastic events. Um, and, and just, I've got no, uh, I've got no reason to stop doing that. Um, I, I love being a part of, of this industry and, and love being a part of this technology, which every time we think we're kind of getting to some kind of normalization of it, something else happens and blows it out the water and we have to then start again. And, and the opportunities for continuous learning have just been incredible um, and, and really keeps you on your toes being in this industry. Absolutely. Are you, are you, are you telling me or are you telling us that uh, basically all of us are at the beginning of this hockey stick? You know what I mean? I, I feel like it's a continuing hockey stick, to be honest with me, with you. Um, it's um, like I said, you know, we just kind of get our heads around, you know, um, what makes, you know, a really nice um, um, conversation from a design perspective. We just get our heads around, technology and intents and all those kind of things and everyone kind of you know gets it and we start bringing the world along with us and then you know something like large language models comes along and we have to all, almost start again and it's another learning opportunity so i think that yeah I, I think that we're still at the beginning of the hockey stick um i i just i can't see it leveling off anytime soon um it just feels like we're just constantly looking up which is great you know because it like i said it's an opportunity for continuous learning there's no opportunity to sit back and relax. It's it's a really high, highly energetic industry. Yeah, that that fits our profile. Yeah. Um, but, but if you look at the, you just said uh, LLMs came and then sort of things changed. Um, one of the things I said LLMs are going to do is they going to make the intent and utterance part of uh, conversation designer job. Um, less important or smaller and and that can be automated through an LLM <clears throat> or or uh, in another way but at least the the we're upping the game for the conversation designers it's becoming more complex um and the other thing i see and i don't know how you view that uh in the in the um, hr business is that um in the beginning there was a lot of oh we need to have a great conversation with the uh, with the customer and it was all, was all about the great conversation and now if you take the standpoint of the consumer um it's it's about it should be about get me from a to b as fast as possible and that should be a great experience um not the chit chat or the wonderful conversation you know i want to get my stuff done um so that, that there's a very thin line um to walk between having a great conversation and, and that's from our point of view um and having a great customer experience from the customer point of view and how do you how do you walk that line in HR? Because I think it's different than probably um, administrative or selling something. Yeah, it's it's a good question. I mean, I think my my thought process has always been start with the customer experience and work backwards. Um, so I feel as though, and and it's probably like you said, because I'm in that kind of world of HR and recruitment, the the kind of small talk elements of of conversation design haven't really been an important factor in what I've done because um, somebody comes onto a career site, they're not wanting to talk about what the weather's like or talk about or find a joke or all those kind of things. And I, and I, so for me, I've always been around um, getting a, getting a user from A to B as quickly, but as fantastically as possible, you know, so the experience still needs to be brilliant. Um, we still need to utilize, you know, some, some really, really, you know, important conversation design principles. Um, but the, the the design of the actual conversation is very transactional, um, absolutely, um, in our world. So, so I think that, um, yeah, I, th I think you're right. Um, I think that if I'm honest, thinking about it as a consumer, I I wouldn't want to go on to, you know, the 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 help site for Amazon and have small talk with a chatbot there. I'd want to talk about a refund or something that's not right or something. Yeah. You know, so I think most interactions that consumers have with um with um chat or voice or what have you should be very transactional 
because it's all about providing a, a great, seamless, convenient, immediate experience rather than um, un unless you're, you know, you're creating some kind of like social um, uh, social companion bot or something like that. You know, so so I think that um, that's where I've always stood. But but I think certainly in, in the world of HR and recruitment, it's it's very much there because everything we do is kind of transactional. And uh, um, um, I, I agree, and I, I see that. But how do you manage to make? Because in, in, no, let me let me go one step back. If you look at regular chatbot, everybody's talking about okay, we create personas and we have the conversation for the persona, which makes perfect sense, um, and then sort of it should fit the profile of the persona. Now here you have a you're recruiting, and you can't say it's a certain persona. It's 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 uh, it's, it's different. So how do you approach that with in my vision, you can't use personas per se because you maybe there's age differences, but still you, you don't know who you're recruiting, and it could be from any function in the company, from uh, the cleaner to the CEO. Well, maybe not CEO, but any level uh, under that. So there's there's s such a big difference between what you're recruiting for. How do you do that? You, you can do that in some circumstances. So if you're creating a bot that's purely um, concerned with um, early careers recruitment, so recruiting graduates out of university or school leavers, then you can do those kind of things because you can map the type of persona that you're trying to um, encourage. And actually, within most of recruitment now, um, as in more forward-thinking organizations, there is a form of recruitment marketing, um, talent attraction. So within that, you're still looking at kind of the old-fashioned, so old-fashioned, the, the kind of the good stuff in, in marketing around um, who's our perfect persona and all those kind of things. So you can do that. But building the actual bot persona is a really, really interesting one because most of the time um, what I try to do and, and the business I work with prefer is making sure that the brand is reflected properly. So what kind of employer brand do you have? What kind of... Um, um, what kind of language do you like to use within your employer branding content? And we can replicate that within the conversation. Um, we also try and talk to the recruiters to replicate some of the recruiters' personality as well. Because, and I'm sure most people talk about this, but, but the way that I approach um, working with organizations on, on building chatbots is think about it as another member of staff. And so... If you've it's a digital got, co-worker. Exactly. It's a digital co-worker. So if you've got a new member of staff coming in, you're not just going to say, right, there's your computer over there, there's your telephone over there, off you go, um, get on with it. That's not the way that you bring on a member of staff. You onboard them properly. You talk to them about how, um, about how to interact with your end users. You talk about you know, how we talk on the phone. You know, Here's all of our email templates. This is the language we use. Here's our um, here's our branding guidelines, all those kind of things that come into how an individual reflects the organization to the people that they're interacting with it has to be the same within um, within chat as well. So we do all of that and we make sure that that is, is there and apparent. But yes, you're quite right in terms of the personas that you're interacting with. It can be very, very difficult if you've got a multifunction, um, multi-role recruitment business that, like you said, goes from CEO middle management, white collar, blue collar, unskilled labor, et cetera. It can be totally different, but there are opportunities to do that, like I said. And would you then build different bots for different purposes? Like a recruitment, uh, a graduate bot uh, would be different from uh, middle management or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so um, again, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges that we've had in, in recruitment, um, in, in people that want to... Uh, it, that want to build chatbots in recruitment is there are a lot of vendors out there and a lot of those vendors just have you know plug-in templates basically and and a lot of those vendors don't have conversation designers in-house or external it's starting to change a little bit but they don't you know and so um a lot of the work i do is is coming in and actually doing some of the conversation design work on behalf of either the vendors or or the uh, clients of those vendors um so so that isn't that that kind of piece around building a specific bot for a specific type of um 
role or a specific type of group of people isn't really thought about to start with. Um, so it's important that people do start thinking about that. Um, there are opportunities, like I said, where you know we'll build a bot just for graduate recruitment because that's more high volume um, and 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 more um, you can get value a lot quicker out of a chatbot for something that's more high volume in the recruitment business. Um, so so we'll, we might just build a specific bot for a specific type of campaign or, like you said, have either something very generic or um, something that um, is very targeted. But the targeted ones are, are few and far between. How, how far do you see the uh, a recruitment chatbot going? Um, and, and let me explain. You know, of course, uh, we have a, a, a conversational AI. It means we can create a chatbot and have AI behind it, an LLM, <coughs> creating, uh, getting information, creating answers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but would you envision a situation where um, you go through the first hoops and the first steps and then you say, oh, we could do a, a sort of a pre-interview and then switch to a digital human um, where there's some sort of semi-human interaction where it starts asking questions you would ask in an interview, but like a pre-interview or something, and get more data in a, or, or information from the candidate, um, sort of, I don't know, to, to, to reel them in in a, in a positive way to keep them engaged, so to speak. W would you envision something like that? And how far can we, uh, as a conversation, uh, conversation people, um, how far can we push this? And what do you envision in, in five years' time? Are there any recruiters left? Or <laughs> is it uh, digital humans, uh, conversational AI, doing everything? Because there's one, one interesting thing. If you go to the mental health sphere, they've done, uh, I've read a few articles, but th there's a lot of research going on now where they see that um, people using mental health apps or, or chatbots even, uh, they're more open... Yeah. Um, and, and they're easier in giving information they wouldn't give to you, which is really interesting because there's a, a level of trust, apparently, um, which is a job well done by the creators of the bot, by the way. Um, but that level of trust allows them to get information and, and have that interaction. Would you envision something like that in HR and how far are we going to go? Yeah. And how fast? I, th I think that's a, a, a really interesting question. And, and, you know, one of the things that I continuously deal with is, is technology going to replace recruiters? Um, I think it's going to replace parts of the recruiter's role. Um, certainly the more robotic, the more kind of repetitive types of um, um, things that they do. Um, but yeah, so I absolutely see a time where on the transactional recruitment piece, a recruiter doesn't need to be involved. Absolutely. Because like you said, there is so much that you can do with technology um, and, and you can do that all now, but it's about plugging it all together and making it into a, a seamless experience for um, for the candidate, for the for the job seeker. So um, so I do see a time actually in the future where technology will take over the transactional parts of the recruitment process. You know, the um, the chatbot on the career site, ask, answer, <clears throat> excuse me, answering questions about um, about the role, you know, and taking a kind of initial application which could just be a you know a couple of questions upload your resume which we don't really i don't think resumes are uh, important anymore in the job um you know it could be it could be anything it could be you know part, paste your linkedin url whatever you know just a quick application to you know um and then yes absolutely you should then be invited to a, a digital interview with um you know potentially, potentially a digital human i built a, uh, a prototype of that using soul machines recently um, and um, it's interesting because when you when you talk to recruiters they go no 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 people like dealing with people and I like, actually no people don't like dealing with people and utilize um, that anecdotal um, piece from from um, from healthcare bots and from mental healthcare bots to say actually what we find um, is people want convenience and they want technology and they actually are more open to talking to technology than people. Um, so, so, so there's a, there's an interesting kind of pushback in the recruitment industry where they believe it's a very people focused um, industry and people focused process, which it is because you're dealing with people, but you're dealing with standard consumers. You're not dealing with a special subsect of the human species. You know, you're dealing with people that 
interact with technology every single day of their lives, you know. Having said that, that that's really interesting. I, I, I know you, but I know that's what you're all about. But if uh, recruiters say that, how come the um, AI-driven software to analyze uh, CVs um, is being used so often uh, that you have now software that actually influences the way th that algorithm works? <laughs> so you have your CV created, your letter created by software that sort of gets it through the AI scanner, um, CV scanner of the, the, re the company that is recruiting. Um, there is nothing human about that. Right. So, so, so let me tell you this now. Um, and, and can, can I can I say one yeah, more thing sure. in the context? Yeah. You said something really, really important. I think uh, we're all about chatbots, but this is a societal development. Um, like you said, CVs are less important. I, I fully agree. It's not anymore about um, uh, all the, the the pumped up CVs where uh, we can all verify that or not. Um, it's who you are and what you can actually do. Mm -hmm. Um, and how you interact with people or technology for that matter, but, um, and that you, you can get that from a CV. So my, my question, additional question would be, how do you put that into a chatbot where I know there's chatbots that have sentiment analysis or fa uh, uh, if on the facial part where it recognizes your emotion, emotions, um, how would you how would you envision vision such a thing um, being used? Because I think the the AI in scanning CVs it's sort of it doesn't feel right to be honest. Okay, so um, so there's a couple of things that the the, the the a couple of questions there to answer. Let's go back to the first one. Um, so there's there's a, a continuous conversation in within the recruitment industry, and I think um, I would be doing my my colleagues and my peers are disservice by not answering this question very, very, very directly. Um, the whole um, conversation around creating your CV for, um, for for bots that work within the ATS, the applicant tracking system, to sift out who's right and who's wrong, that is a complete and utter load of rubbish. Um, and, and I'll tell you that now. And it's something that we all get so annoyed. I love about. your answer. <laughs> I'm going to be perfectly blunt. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and, and as far as most people in my industry are concerned, that is that has been a marketing technique used by people who who charge money to build CVs for people um, who, who, who sell the software that does exactly. That. So I'm going to answer the first question. Um, the first question um, was around. Um, AI that that screens CVs and resumes, um, what have you. It's a load of rubbish. Um, so, um, and I, I, like I said, I'd be doing my um, I'd be doing my colleagues and my peers in the recruitment industry a bit of a disservice to not answer that very directly. There are there is no such thing as an ATS compliant CV. Um, so that is um, a marketing marketing technique used by people that build CVs and charge money for it. Um, there is no such thing as an ATS compliant CV. Um, there are absolutely algorithms within the applicant tracking system that help a recruiter to sift out applications and sift out CVs, but you cannot build a CV that beats the bot because there's no such thing. <laughs> Let's make that very, very clear. Very um, but yes, you're right. You know, there, there are absolutely um, chatbots out there that can help with sentiment analysis. Um, we can ask situational questions such as, Tell me about a time when you when you have delivered exceptional customer service, um, and we can you know we can utilize the answers there, push it through um, personality and sentiment analysis to create an understanding of the person, just in the same way that writing that answer out or giving that answer to a person, they can do exactly the same thing, um, utilizing various different kind of personality traits, big five, all those kind of things. Um, is that is that a bit like the demo, uh, Jim Robot, Jim Robot? Jim, yeah, uh, built, built uh, with Juji. Yes, very similar. Um, I mean, that's that's something that Juji's done recently. But that, those kind of um, chatbots in recruitment have been around for for a good few years now. Um, okay. So, um, but it's something that um, looked good um, when I saw Jim do it, and um, and I, I had a few questions, which which um, Juji doesn't then, surprise me. No, of course. Um, um, but yeah, so so it, it, it's that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on the other side, uh, we're, it's an interesting one because I actually wrote a blog about it this week. So 
um, there was a piece of technology that came out in recruitment, which was about um, um, working out whether an application had been created through ChatGPT. So, um, um, so what that meant was, have you have you used ChatGPT to write a cover letter, to write a CV, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, we will within a ninety eight percent um um uh within 98 percent we'll be able to tell you um whether or not chat gpt is used, which is a little rubbish because even open ai's text classifier can only be at 24 percent. so that 98 percent probably isn't right but it then rose it, it, it then get, gave rise to a really really good question which is if a job seeker is using chat gpt to support their application are they giving themselves an unfair advantage or is it a wake-up call to the recruitment industry to say actually with the um you know with the with the birth of chat gpt comes the death of cvs and cover letters um you know and and that's i a, that's an interesting quote right boy oh thank you um so so i i, I will you, use it yeah you can use it absolutely um so so i wrote a blog about it this week and and ultimately the way that i see it is the death of the CV and the cover letter has been coming for a very, very long time. And for us recruiters, we need to recognize that. Um, we need to think about different ways of doing it. And we're, we're now trying to encourage the industry to move towards skills based hiring. So rather than, like you said, looking at a list of things on a CV and working out whether or not the person can do it, actually assessing their skills and seeing whether or not their skills line up with what we're looking for in that role. And that's the only way you're going to be able to get around you know getting rid of cvs and cover letters because they're just they're useless and they're, and they're even more useless now that you can just ask chat gpt to you can throw in your cv throw in the job advert and say write me a great cover letter you know rewrite my cv to match this job it it, it it's uh it, they're, they're useless pieces of uh, paper now and I, um one of my other guests uh, told me a story about uh, also in the podcast that a day uh, in the old days, old days, not so long ago, people would put um, um, in their cover letter or in the CV in white, so you wouldn't see it. Um, uh, so it's white on white, but it would still be uh, by the AI recognized as letters. Put in the the exact text of the of the advert <laughs> for the for the, the for the job. <laughs> Uh, just copy it, but it wouldn't be visible, and the AI would pick it up and say, "Oh, it matched all the, it's got the right words," um, and they would be picked. They they took that out of the algorithm now. But, I, um, like I said, yeah, this whole kind of um, beat the cat and mouse box. game. Yeah, it's, it, well, it's a load of rubbish. This whole beat the ATS box thing, and so pasting the job advert into your into your CV um, and putting it in white. I mean, it's not going to help at all. So, so you know, the, in the background. What happens with most um, applicant tracking systems? They will they'll receive so so they'll receive the CV from the application, which most of the time you've been asked to rewrite your CV in the application form anyway. So let's not even start on that terrible um, experience. But they'll receive your CV and they'll throw it through um, a natural language parsing tool, which will pull out your job experience, you know, your education experience, and potentially some keywords in. Um, you know, in, in your uh, um, your opening paragraph or what have you, but but it won't really pull out much more. It's just looking to create a profile of you, which is have you, what's your education experience, what's your career experience. So it pulls that out, and most of the time it doesn't pull it out that successfully because there's no one standard format for a CV, and that's about it. You know, and and so there might be some analysis done um, with some of the more um, modern tools around whether you could be a um, a good bad or or maybe you know and they'll just traffic light it but then the recruiter still has to go through those there's no automatic um decision making and actually it's a very very good point especially here in europe um it's it's against gdpr to have automatic decision making done so um so you mean because always... you might have a bias in exactly the, in the system exactly but also you know people need to know how their data is being used and all those kind of things so so in gdpr there's a there's a um, a rule around automatic decision making based on data that's been submitted by the uh, by the data owner. So um, so that doesn't happen. You know, like I said, there's 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 lists of potential yes, nos, and maybes, but a recruiter will always go through. Um, which is why 
sometimes you don't hear back from recruiters for a long time and sometimes you don't hear from back from them at all which is why a chatbot is so important because the next steps after that would be to have a more in-depth telephone conversation talk to me about your experience in this role talk to me about this talk to me about that and all they're doing is creating notes pulling out some insights from that and we know now that you can do that with with ai you know so absolutely for me the next stage should be digital human having that same conversation um, and, and pulling in the same data and making that decision on that data or, or passing it on to a, a human to make that decision. Um, so, so basically it's triaging and preparing for the real conversation, yep. human to human. Exactly. And that's, that's what a recruiter does. They triage, they help give a quick telephone screen. Have you got half an hour to talk through your application? But, it, but they can only do that to, to a limited number of people because they're humans. And this is the issue with us humans is that you know, we still need to sleep and all those kind of things. And we can only have one conversation at a time. Um, I worked out once that if all a recruiter was doing was a quick kind of 10 minute telephone screen of a candidate, they can have 53 conversations a day. And when you've got a job that has hundreds of applications, you're never going to get through all of them. Um, and most recruiters have dozens of, of jobs they're recruiting for at the same time. So, so, so you move the process forward to, to the bot or digital human. Yep. Uh, as much as possible, so all candidates actually get a fair chance. All candidates get a fair chance. They don't get ghosted. Um, they get to talk to a representative of the brand. They get an opportunity to ask questions because you can do that on a bot as well. Um, and you can still and you can then schedule the next stage using the bot. You know, scheduling doesn't have to be with a human again. So it's uh, um, you can you can totally automate that those first stages of the recruitment process. That's uh, um, um... Actually, you would go towards a fairer opportunity where it's, it's more equal um, because people don't get, uh, if you're not really good at uh, writing CVs, but you're actually, a great, you have a great personality, you have great skills, and you're a very good colleague, um, you would never get to that stage based on your CV. But if someone talks to you and gets a good impression, uh, or the bot does that, then uh, that might help. And how do you view, or or maybe does the the HR um, bot as as you work with, like you work with, does that require special technology, or you can use the general uh, chatbot platforms for that, or you uh, need a special platform for that? It's a good question. There are um, there are dozens of um, recruitment specific chatbot technologies. Some of those applicant tracking systems also have their own kind of chatbot solutions. Um, none of them are as um, advanced as some of the ones that we use in the kind of general kind of world of conversational AI. Some of them are based on some of that technology, you know, some of those vendors will use like Core or, um, or Dialogflow or IBM to, um, um, to provide that kind of conversational backend. The, but there's no reason why you can't utilize a, a generic conversation on our platform, Cognigy, VoiceFlow, whatever. Um, the, the only challenge you always have is integrations. So um, obviously within our world in recruitment, we've got, you know, specific systems, applicant tracking systems, candidate relationship management tools, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so you need to make sure that there, that there's an integration available, which nowadays isn't really such a big thing. It's just that the recruitment chatbot vendors come with those integrations out of the box, which but, but sort of most of the times it's uh, the, the platform uh, for the recruitment uh, business has have an, they have APIs. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a chatbot platform that can handle APIs. Exactly. Way, yeah, like I said, it's not problem. really much of an issue. They just come out of the box with the vendors. So, so it means that there's less work that needs to do to get them up and running from an integration perspective. Um, and obviously, you know, some of the more advanced recruitment chatbot systems have all of that training data around recruitment specific conversations and all those kind of lovely things so there are benefits to it um but if i was um i i i couldn't put my hand on my heart and say there's no reason why you couldn't use something else and and there are plenty of organizations out there that have built their own as well because i can imagine that if you you have a, you're a large corporate and and you have a recruitment bot and you have a, a FAQ bot and you have a commercial bot working with three different platforms, uh, that's a disaster in the making. Um, 
and because uh, because the people can't be trained on three platforms, um, and the cost would be tremendous. Although this is actually what happens in most companies that you know <laughs> HR goes one way and uh, yeah, so the the, the marketers go one, and that that's. So how do you bring that together? Because um, they, they get you in as a, as a consultant, you're on the HR side, and then you view, oh, but you have a chatbot maybe for FAQs on your website. We know there are some horrible platforms out there that can do literally nothing mm. other than answer a few questions and that's it. But they were selected for whatever reason. Uh, how do you manage that? How do you move them to one platform where you don't even try? I don't know. There's, uh, there's so many different situations and scenarios, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, absolutely makes more sense to have one platform, you know, and, and if you've already got, you know, a large corporate that has um, already got a, a fantastic uh, relationship with a, a conversational AI vendor or CCAS vendor or something like that, then there's no reason why you can't investigate using that. Um, and, and actually, as a, on the flip side, recruitment, teams sometimes end up getting lumbered with software that they don't want as well, um, which which isn't up to the task. You know, so, you know, an organization might um, decide that that they're going all in on Oracle or or SAP. Salesforce. Or, yeah, exactly. Or Salesforce or Workday or whatever. And, and they end up getting lumbered with the recruitment part of that system, which might not be best of breed either. Um, so so there's lots of things that, that go on within an organization on the technology side of things that Sometimes you just don't want to open that 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 can of worms. Box of Pandora. Yeah, that Pandora's box, absolutely. Um, and and it just becomes a bit of a political nightmare. Um, most of the time, it um, most of the time it does make more sense to go with a recruitment specific vendor um, because you do have the opportunity to um, remove headaches around integrations. You do have the opportunity to. Um, remove headaches around training data um, and what have you. Um, but, and so that's that's usually the way that most recruitment teams want to go. They, they, and, and actually it's something we've not really discussed is that there is also this very um, definitive line between recruitment and HR when it comes to chatbot use cases as well. So we've talked a lot about recruitment, um, but on the HR side of things, it's very much um, more similar to um, IT, um, internal kind of IT service centers and those kind of things. So HR, whilst you've got the kind of the more kind of people focused people, the, the, the business partners, you also have the service features as well. So an HR bot will do a lot of the transactional stuff around booking holidays, asking about policies, benefits, all those kind of things that are kind of more HR. And that can be done with a generic chatbot. So, so when it comes to the HR stuff, absolutely try to bring them in on whatever platform they're using elsewhere because most of the time that can be done on the very recruitment specific stuff the transactional recruitment stuff it still makes more sense to go with a, a recruitment specific vendor because of that um training data because of that knowledge and because of the the integrations that are already there so how you go about <coughs> sorry um basically selling them or or helping them decide to have a second chatbot platform next to the already existing platform. Is there a, a cost benefit or is there, are there other benefits that are quantifiable that if they make a business case or first they make a use case, then a business case that actually, even though you have to run two platforms, it's actually a, I would assume positive business case. How do you go about that? It's a really good question. Um, usually they run in silo because, um, you've got this kind of larger, kind of um, more customer focused um, chatbot that um, does you know, some specific tasks and then you've got this recruitment one. And so most of the time the organization isn't really looking for that kind of holistic approach um, to everything. Um, and, and they understand that recruitment is a very, very specific experience um, that sometimes needs to be um, looked at in silo as well. So the business cases are, very similar to the business cases around most kind of um, conversational AI um, um, sales, um, but it, it looks like different. It's around um, it's around um, reducing things like time to hire, um, access to talent, um, around um, better candidate experience, around um, better recruitment productivity, recruiter productivity, opex savings potentially around um, reduction headcount in recruitment teams. 
don't want to say it out loud, but it has to be said because recruitment unfortunately always gets um, the worst part of, of any um, downsizing because if you're downsizing an organization, you don't need to hire. So therefore recruitment gets... Uh, um, I think there's a flaw, in, not in your thinking, but in general, I think there's a flaw in that thinking because um, we're going a bit off topic, but uh, it's something, it bugs me if I look at companies. How is it possible that, that companies, um, so we're going to do a little mind experience here. How is it possible that companies that are apparently are run well, right? They're managed well, they make a good profit. Um, and in that profit, they hire, 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 right? And then all of a sudden uh, sales go down a bit or is an economic downturn or something happens. And then they start fire, fire, fire. Mm -hmm. And all that money they poured into recruiting and training and onboarding and, and what have you um, is going down the drain because uh, they follow the economic cycle. And I have never, ever understood, and, and, and I have little respect for companies that do this um, because it gives the employees a, a huge amount of uncertainty. So they, they know with the least downturn, then, you know, they're going to have layoff rounds. So they're, they're never sure of their job. Yeah. I, I also think we're living in a time where you can never be sure of your job no. anyway, but that's not for everyone. Um, but the, the, what do you think of uh, that way, looking at it from a recruitment uh, perspective, that way of managing your company, whereas if you are doing really well, that should be the moment you have enough money to invest in automating, um, upping your game, becoming scalable, which we're all about, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have enough money, if you have to lay people off, to give them enough money to find something else or help them find something else. And, and there's no problem. There's no pain because they you can easily find another job. How come the people that should be managing the company and make it ready for a downturn are not doing that? And they just fire people and hire people and and all, they all think it's a good policy. It's it, it, it's mind blowing, isn't it? Um, I, yes. I I wish I could answer you on behalf of all the corporates out there, but um, for, from my perspective, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. Um, I think that what we saw in the pandemic and what we're seeing since the pandemic is that um, everything is very reactive, you know. Um, and and look, we didn't see the pandemic coming. We didn't see the war in Ukraine coming, kind of. Um, but yeah, you know, we we didn't. You know, all of these things. You know, the the the, the you know rising costs of everything. You know, nobody sees any of this coming. You know, and so everything that we do as a society and as an economy is very reactive. You know, um, and like I said, we saw it in the pandemic when nobody was ready for um, furloughing people, working from home, all those kind of things. And everyone panicked and had to come up with the best solutions they could, which was great for, you know, automation tools, technology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it kind of creates this kind of spike in requirements. And, and it's really difficult from a perspective of in, in our industry to be able to say, okay, well, you know, we're riding on a high now and we're going to be at a high forever because we're not, because we'll go back to normality and everyone will stop buying automation. Um, but, yeah, I, I kind of, so there's a, there's a few kind of lessons to be learned, I think. The first one is um, keep treating your people well, because if you do have to lay people off, because that's, that's the only option you've got to keep the business going to protect the people that you don't lay off, treat them well, because then they'll come back to you. Um, you know, give them a great offboarding process, you know, create a lovely community of alumni, keep in touch with them, make them feel like they're still part of the family. You could use a chatbot for that. You could use a chatbot for that. And there's other great um, alumni tools as well, but you can absolutely lay a, um, lay a chatbot on top of it to keep people in touch and to have those kind of ongoing conversations. Um, it's great because I actually mapped out all the conversational opportunities within the, the entire life cycle of a person at an organization. And most of the time, you can you can put a chatbot um, in, in there. Um, you know, give, give people a really good experience while they're in post and also while they're leaving. You know, if you think about the way that universities and colleges treat their their leaving students, they don't just kind of boot them out and 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 give them a terrible experience. They treat them like kings. You know, they put them through this lovely graduate ceremony. They put caps on them. You know, they give them a nice certificate, but they keep in touch with them as well, and they build these alumni communities. And so, when organisations start thinking about their leavers in the same way that universities and colleges do, they'll have a great opportunity to bring those people back when times are better. 
because that's the most economic way to hire is to bring people back because they already know the system, they already know the business, they have all of that wealth of knowledge inside them. So the time to productivity is is quicker and therefore the time to make revenue out of those people is quicker as well. So that would be my my siren song to all organizations out there that are going through this. Treat your leave as well, build a lovely community of alumni, and then when times are better and you need to rehire, rehire those people because they'll want to come back. Um, but I agree. That is, if you have no other option than doing that. But how do you feel about that? Um, I call that good weather managers and bad weather managers. There's a lot of good weather managers out there that are very capable in an economic upturn to manage their company yep. and create a profit. But the bad weather managers are actually the ones that are able to keep the company afloat in all times. If you can manage in bad weather, you can certainly manage in good weather. Mm -hmm. And there's um, a bad manage manage bad weather manager, my my terminology. <laughs> he's always busy preparing for the bad weather. Yeah. So it's getting the company ready. Um, so uh, is accepts a little less profit now to invest in technology or lay people off mm -hmm. now when we're actually making money and we're automating because uh, then it makes sense. And, and, and I feel that also with the automating, we've seen that in, in, in COVID, um, they're, they're, they're running behind. They, they, they start automating when it's actually too late yeah. and, you know, you need time and money to do it. And, and then, you know, if you're trying to save money, that becomes sort of a, I don't know, a, a complicated battle. I, I agree. And, yeah, I, I agree. I think I think there's something to be said, and I've always said it as well, is plan for the worst case scenario, um, because then anything more than that is a bonus. And and so, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that um, it's now really... Comes the nasty, but now comes the nasty question. Are, are you... Do you think... I need to ask it properly, otherwise I'm guiding you. <clears throat> do you think that the implementation of um, uh, HR chatbots or recruitment chatbots, basically reducing the amount of recruiters you need, um, will help in uh, managing, uh, help bad weather managers creating, or it will actually help the good weather managers um, to do whatever they, 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 do, they always do. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I, I think the answer is both, ultimately, because if you start thinking about implementing automation and technology when times are good, then you're prepared for when times are bad. But when you're implementing it when times are good, you're also providing a fantastic experience to people and therefore being a good organisation. I think the I think the thing that you have to remember is that when times are bad, and you've got you know hundreds of thousands of people being laid off across the world those people are looking for jobs and even if you're not recruiting if you're providing a really good experience to people throughout that process so you're you're almost pre-screening them for jobs that aren't already there you're bringing them into a a talent community you're keeping in touch with them you're engaging with them because they've shown interest in your organization but there might not be a role there for them then when times get better and you're hiring again you've also still got this um, fantastic pool of people to call off of. So I think there's benefits to both the good weather and the bad weather managers when you're implementing technology. Um, ultimately, as technology professionals, we're always going to say that you should implement technology because it's always a good idea. But but taking your your example- We're biased. Yeah. We're, we're but, very biased. Well, absolutely, absolutely. But, but you know, taking your points um, and thinking about it as an organization and as a, a people leader, then I would absolutely say, you know, if you're if you if you start implementing it now, you're prepared for the downturn because you can do more with less. Um, if you're implementing it now, you're also prepared for for good times because the the experience you're providing to people is exceptional as well. And like I said, you're you can still provide that experience through the downturn as well. Which why wouldn't you want to do that? Eh? And one last question about this. How could we use the technology to help the, the, the good weather managers become bad weather managers? Not because we can influence the economic uh, situation, but uh, to have them understand that the te technology allows them to uh, become more efficient and, and sort of pushes them to um, automate where, where 
possible so they they uh, lay people off if they have to not that I'm pro laying laying people off but it, when there's enough money and the econ- economy is good and there's no problem finding a different job but they're just getting their company ready to to become scalable and actually in, in the long term make a lot more money but never have to lay off people if there's an e- economic downturn because for a lot of people job security is um, if you have that and, and you go together through an economic downturn and you crawl back up, that creates loyalty. Mm. Um, and I think that that part, that, that part of loyalty is often forgotten. If, and, and you put that in your story as well. It's like, if you take good care of the people, uh, you know, you get, uh, people that want to work for you, want to come back. Um, they sort of become ambassadors. Well, that's obviously what you yeah. should have. Um, but how do, how do how can we use technology to change that paradigm? I, I think that it's a it's a great point and a great question. Um, ultimately, I I don't think I think it's about the education that we provide to people. So if every technology vendor was to take the monologue that I did for the last five minutes around how it's good for both bad and good times, and bring that into their customers and bring that into their sales decks and all those kind of things, then you're educating people into the benefits of the not just now, but the benefits of a lifetime of utilizing this technology and and how the technology can support you through the good and the bad. Um, And so I don't think it's about turning good weather managers into bad weather managers. I think it's about educating and evangelizing that this technology um, is there for the good times, but it also protects you in the bad times as well. Um, so I think it's our role as technologists to ensure that that, that, that message is heard loud and clear by our users. Um, but I don't think that we're ever going to be in a place where we can help change people's mindsets. But I think if people know that that's there in their toolkit, then they can, then it's there for them to use. And they're, and they're almost, almost there in terms of preparation for the bad times. Well, thank you for that. And, and, and there's one thing we left in, in this process untouched because we talked about uh, specific HR software or bots. Um, we talked about recruiting bots, but there's this nasty thing called onboarding. And, um, and that's, that's actually a process in between the recruitment part and the, the HR part. Yeah. Um, and we both know that is, if you want to have a good start, that is extremely important. So my question is, if the experience in the recruitment bot is amazing, as you just, you know, that's what we want, um, HR bot, okay. It's about giving information, answering questions. Usually the experience is not that great. It's just very functional. Um, how do you propose, um, that gap should be bridged by that's onboarding. Um, how do you propose people should do that? It sh- should it be the recruitment part of the bot? Should it be the HR or, or a third bot? <laughs> it's such a good or question. Or no bot at all. No, it's such a good question. Um, and it's a, and, and actually, I, I, I do, a, yeah. So onboarding is really interesting. Um, so, so we know as talent professionals, as people professionals, whatever you want to call myself or, or the people that work in the recruitment industry, um, we know that that's actually one of the biggest problem areas of the process because at the minute there is a, a, very, a very, very high number of, of non-starters on day one non-starters of, of people that Seriously? You know, renege their offers you know, because they're getting better offers elsewhere and all those kind of things. So we've had a lot of problems with this um, across the board. So this for me is kind of the new, the new battleground when it comes to your people um, is onboarding. I hate using those terms kind of battleground and war for talent, but it is because we need to concentrate on it. The challenge you have in organizations is that from organization to organization, it changes who's responsible for that process. So sometimes recruitment is responsible for getting somebody to the start date. Sometimes recruitment's only responsible for getting people to accept an offer and then handing over to learning and development who look at, who, you know, which is kind of almost like a sub part of HR, um, who then look after that kind of onboarding process because they're, because for learning and development, it's, it's a, um, it's almost like a pre-induction process. So the induction is you know, learning all about the organization and 
your role and what have you. Um, and there's, so there's no two organizations that ever, there, there's no pattern is what I'm trying to say. So, so most organizations do things differently. So um, my thought process is put a piece of technology in there. Absolutely. Um, and again, there are some amazing technologies. I think that, um, I think again, organizations have to think about going from transactional because the onboarding process is broken. We know that because people aren't turning up on day one. And most of the times now the onboarding process is, oh, it's day 10, fill in this form. Oh, it's day 30, send me a copy of your passport. Oh, it's day four, you know, do this. And, and it's very transactional and you've- and Fragmented. It's fragmented. There's radio silence. You don't talk to anyone. You're just filling in forms, submitting information, you know, getting your tax forms, getting your payroll forms, all those kind of things. And it's, it's just admin and it's very, it's very transactional. So I and say, standardized. And, well, it, it, it is, but it's, it's, it's boring. It's not a great experience, is it? Especially when, you know, you, you've, you've handed in your notice in one organization that you've had a fantastic time with, that you've had a great offer here. Um, and then you've got one, three, six months of just sitting there, not hearing from anyone, filling in some forms, choosing your laptop, waiting for your access card for your office, you know, those kind of things. And so my, thought process is you need to turn that onboarding period into something that's more interactive, um, that's more social, um, that's more, um, that takes it to the next level. So we always think of kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we've got this kind of onboarding hierarchy to say, okay, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. Let's take them up to that kind of self-actualization level. Let's give them a sense of belonging to the organization. And so, being able to do that with technology is absolutely possible, whether it be digital humans, whether it be with uh, social interaction platforms, whether it's with chatbots, absolutely. Because I believe that as people, we crave that interaction. We crave that sense of belonging, especially to an organization that we've just, it's such a, it's such a life-changing decision, moving job. So, so you wanna make sure you've made the right decision. And so the experience that you received during that time needs to needs to give you that confidence that you've made the right decision and so if you do that you can do that easily with technology you don't need to expect recruiters or hr teams to pick up the phone and have little chats with people you can do that with technology you can do that with conversational technology you can do that with social interaction technology but dear lord we have to make it better because of those reasons I agree. I hear so often that people have a great experience with a recruiter who was really fast to, to, you know, to reel in the talent. Yeah. And then uh, they sort of agree on a salary and blah, 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 blah. And then they have to get a contract. And then the wait starts because then it's HR and legal and, and whoever. And they get no information, no, no. Like if you have a parcel, you get a track and trace. There's no track and trace on where's my contract yeah. now. And so the great experience the recruiter or the software is creating in the, in the front, sort of in the middle where it starts getting, you know, the machine starts getting stuck. And, and the moment as a candidate, you have to call for where's my contract because I need to, you know, sign it before I stop my, I cancel my, uh, my, my current job. Mm -hmm. And that's where the frustration starts. And that's when people are, are open to other offers because, oh, the company is like, it's like this. Um, I'm not sure if I want to work for them. So all the effort you've put in in the beginning to create a brand experience, because that's what a recruiter does. Yeah. They're actually brilliant marketers if they do their job properly. Um, the, the sort of process after it uh, sort of ruins that. Do you, do you know, actually, I'm going to take something that you said, and it's something that I talk about a lot. Um, you talked about how I mean, we can track parcels. And when you work with e-commerce businesses or retail businesses and you say to them okay let's automate the top three um customer service queries that you have the top one is always wismo where's my order and you know if we if if we as consumers we go okay i ordered this two weeks ago i don't know where it is i need to find out where it is and you can go onto a system you can find out where you're up to in the process you can text you can chat you can do whatever you want but you can find where you're up to if us recruiters were to enable that, then I think that our CSAT scores would go through the roof because all people want to know is where they're up to in the process. Where's my application? 
where's my contract when's my start date where's my you know so so all those kind of things people want to know and if we were to be very proactive and, and just deliver that to them even better but giving people a channel to know where they're up to in the process would would change the world when it comes to the experience of, of, of recruiting and onboarding absolutely so why isn't it out there <laughs> it's if, a great if, we, if we acknowledge that that is the key to success why don't we see it i why don't I'm, I'm going to be perfectly open and honest with you on my thoughts around this. I don't think recruiters want to open the kimono, as it were. And I don't think that you know, if you submit an application and then two weeks later you say, you know, where's my application up to? Do you as a consumer want to hear that nothing's been done with it? Well, that's actually an interesting question. Um, well, maybe that's the, that you want the honest answer because a, a company that's dishonest to you to start with so that, that, or bullshitting you, would you want to work for them? Well, it, totally. Uh, but I think, I think the question is, would you rather hear nothing or would you rather hear <laughs> that, oh, we did receive your application two weeks ago, but we're so busy that nothing's been done with it. I think that it's, it, it's that kind of, yeah, you know, Sophie's uh, choice would, almost of, of, of information. And so yeah. most recruiters that I talk to about this, they're really uncomfortable because they know that they're they're overworked. They know that they've got too much to do. And, and none of this is saying that recruiters are doing a bad job, by the way. All of this is saying is that recruiters are overworked and we can solve that with technology. But they don't want to then say, OK, well, we'll allow an, an, a, a candidate, an applicant to to find out where they're up to in the process. Oh, it's just stuck at screening stage and it has been there for six weeks. Nothing's been done with it. No, but, but, it yeah. But let's dream a little. Um, what if you could create a situation where you apply and you get feedback? Okay, thank you for your application. We're, we're going to process it. And uh, you get feedbacks like uh, how many applicants there are. So you know the, the umfeld in which you are competing. Um, and then in the process, okay, you're you're in the top. Uh, I don't know. We have had 500 applications. We need to, please uh, bear with us. We need to screen all of them. Uh, we want to give everybody a fair chance. Blah 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 blah. Um, and at some point, okay, we've we've turned down uh, the, the first uh, 300 applicants. You're in the last 200. We're now going to process them, process them a level deeper, um, and then we'll decide who the, the 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 top 10 will invite for a conversation. So and. And you just tell them that that will take us an X amount of time. You just, whether it's WhatsApp or whatever, it doesn't matter. In a, a chat conversation, you will you just send them a message. So you keep them engaged. So they know you won't withhold them um, the information. So they know if they have another application, that's, they know where they're at. Um, and also in terms of planning. And, and a lot of companies now, they, they don't communicate at all. Mm. Uh, or you just get a, an automated reply where it says, uh, oh, okay, thank you for your information and uh, we'll get back to you. But no when, no how, no what. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a black box, you know, and, and, and I think that should stop um, and make the experience better. And, and um, if you, have, you actually have a great brand with a great product or great service, that process of hiring people should reflect uh, in the chatbot or of a software you're using to give that, that potential employee the, the same experience as the customers get. Um, so, and yeah, but, and I don't understand um, why it's, it, it's not happening because uh, it, it's not that hard. It, it's not, it's not. And, and I totally agree with you. I think, look, you know, I think we all know that the recruitment experience is pretty broken. Um, and but that's because there's a mixture of people there's a mixture of um old technology you know old processes you know a lot of things haven't changed in the last 20 years um or more and so we all know it's broken and we all know that what needs to be done to fix it and and i think that right now we're looking for you know some very very kind of brave and adventurous people that want to fix it look you know here's my thought process we can buy a house online we can buy a car online without ever having to deal with a person. And a house is hundreds of thousands of dollars, pounds, euros, whatever. You know, and a car is tens of thousands of pounds, dollars, euros. It's, they're big life-changing decisions, but we make them online. And, and we make them using the information that's served to us online. 
and if we have a problem with it we can chat we can you know we can engage we can converse all through technology so i'm going to go back to our original hypothesis and say actually if you remove the human from the transactional part of the process like i said this is not a bash at recruiters i think recruiters are fantastic hell i've been one for you know a long time um you know i think that i think that when you give them the the transactional part of the process too much for them to do so i think remove the human from the transactional part of that process automate 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 um your experience levels go up you know your processing levels go up and actually you end up with the right with the same outcome with which is somebody getting hired for a role um leave the recruiters to you know build fantastic marketing content leave them to you know build fantastic relationships with the hiring managers leave them to be in charge of the strategy leave them to be the conversation designers the ai trainers the prompt engineers all those kind of things let them control the process but don't let them be a part of the process um and what we'll see from there is we don't need to worry about telling somebody that they're 200 in the queue for screening because 200 people could be screened at the same time using a digital human so i think that a lot of the problems we've just talked about and a lot of the solutions they're totally moot if we just automate that transactional part of the process and basically we're talking about scalability yeah exactly and um um we, we missed one part of uh, i asked the question we, we we missed one part of the answer because we skipped subject is the the the, the part in between where should who should build the um, the onboarding part where should it be should it be as an extension on the recruitment software or as an extension on the hrm software i think that um in my opinion uh it needs to be almost straddling both so i think that there should be something specific around the onboarding process um so um there should be there, there basically should be a an onboarding experience team that probably sits within hr um and usually within kind of learning and development because ultimately you need to think about these people now as employees rather than as people who are yet to be employees recruiters have done their job they found somebody for the role they've accepted an offer they need to be handed off to um to hr um but i think there needs to be somebody who's specifically in charge of that experience within that process because that experience is so important um the it needs it needs somebody specifically to look after it but it's hard to say which which uh in which software you sh you should do that um i I, th i don't think it has anything to do with recruitment software anymore because i think recruitment software needs to stop a, an offer has been accepted you know that those contract details that all the details that have been collected can then be quite nicely moved over to um the hrm or the hris and then that's when onboarding takes over because they are now in um in the hr system as a new starter they are at you know t minus 90 days let's look after them now thank you um having discussed all this you have a website ready with a um a recruitment bot yeah um and uh, of course we're all about testing uh what we talk about so Take it away. Okay, so let me just share my screen. So I haven't played around with this. Um there are uh tens of thousands of um uh that one there. There are tens of the phone that we didn't test it. We don't know what we're I don't know with. what it is. No, I literally found it this morning. Um I know Obviously, it's MGM Resort International. Um, you know, if if anyone's been to Vegas, I'm sure they know. It's US, it. right? It's US. Um, it's a uh, um, hotel chain. Um, well, I think the most famous one's probably in Vegas. I think that's the only one that I know, but that's because I'm not US. Um, so I've gone onto the career site of MGM Resorts, and um, as you can see, bottom corner, there is a um, a chatbot ready to go. Um, kind of. What we'll do is uh, for the people on Spotify, we'll read out what we okay. see and what happens. So even if they only listen, they they understand. Perfect. 
So we've got welcome message, hi, are you looking for a job? And then underneath we've got a couple of action buttons, find a job and ask a question. So I'm gonna hit it and I'm just gonna see what happens. It pops out, okay, great. So MGM Resorts International Recruiter Chatbot um, is at the top. So, um, so straight away we've got some um, privacy statement. Um, the information you provide to the chatbot will be collected to improve your experience. Please read our privacy policy, how we're storing and protecting your data. So there's no um, question around whether you accept it or not. It's just letting you know that. Um, so and straight... one, one, can I ask a question about yeah. this, your, your opinion? Um, it gives you no, no link or no nothing uh, how you get to the privacy policy. Or privacy no, policy, it just says, please read our privacy policy. So I think we probably need so, to scroll to the bottom of the page and find it down here somewhere. Um, and it could have included a link and then update the web page. They, they definitely could but, have included a link, yeah. Um, and there's one other question I would like to ask. It mm -hmm. says it's very functional. It says recruiter chatbot. Mm. Okay. Uh, we both see a lot of chatbots with a name, um, hence uh, a chatbot personality. Um, this chatbot does not have a name. It has the company name and then the function. Mm -hmm. How do you view that? Should it have a name in the recruitment or not? Um, in general, I understand the specifics, but, but yeah, what, I mean, in, what would you do? In, in general, I, <clears throat> I always prefer to have a name. Um, I think that it depends on the interaction you're having. Um, but seeing as you're straight away being asked a question underneath, hi, are you looking for a job? I think that, I think, I always think it's quite nice to almost get a bit of an interruption. You know, so, so we talk about um, the cooperative principle in conversation design. So I feel as though that comes into play straight away um, on, on, on a recruitment chatbot. So I'd rather, I'd rather have a little introduction to say, hi, I'm, I don't know, Simba, uh, the MGM lion, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, that actually makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just coming up with it on the fly. Um, you know, here's the kind of things that I can help you with. You know, and so straight away you're building that rapport and you're also building that, like I said, that cooperative principle around um, exactly oh, what. MGM is the roaring lion, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You can so see the should, lion. They should have the... that here. They should have that uh, that lion here, a little movie or a meme. Yeah. Why not? Uh, yeah, uh, why not? Uh, why not? It, it, it brings personality into it. I think that you can see with some of the imagery behind, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people that are smiling. Um, a lot of the images yeah. that they're using behind a lot of the stock images, I'll just um, bring this back down so we can see, you know, we've got, you know, we've got four people um, on the top row, all of whom are smiling. So it's obviously that they're trying to show that this is a happy place, a fun place to work where people are happy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's obviously some of their corporate imagery, like I was talking about earlier, when we, we build chatbots for recruiters, we find out what their employer brand is. You know, what are you trying to push across in your branding as an employer? You know, and you can see straight away here that MGM Resorts are saying, okay, well, everyone here looks really happy. So why don't we make the experience a happy experience rather than just a very corporate functional, functional experience? Everyone's happy here. Well, it could be both, right? It Absolutely. Could be, it could be functional and happy. Absolutely. So I would have, you know, a, a happy interaction here, whether it be, like you said, a, you know, a roaring lion, a smiling lion, something like that. But I would do something that is on brand um, rather than just having it very um, functional. Absolutely. Um, because okay. the, the, the chatbot should represent the brand as far as I'm concerned. Um, and like I said, you know, it's a great opportunity then to jump straight in and let people know what you can and can't do. You know, I'm, I'm the MGM lion. I'm very happy to work here. Um, I'm going to be your, um, your, 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 your job search concierge. These are the kind of things that I can do for you in this chat. Um, and, okay. And I miss one more thing, whether, um, I'm not sure we're going to find out if it uses AI behind it. Um, if it does, it should have under the new EI, EU rules it should say um we're using ai well um, to power this chatbot so, so so those rules were the draft was was voted through yesterday those rules don't come into play until probably yeah. late next year um so i won't worry about those two now, now but yes i always think that <clears throat> I've, and i've been saying this for the last seven years tell people they're dealing with a bot because your user i mean it's obvious that you are dealing with a bot but tell people, because once you tell people, 
their expectations of the experience change significantly. Um, but yes, you're right. You know, if you if you want to be compliant to the new AI regulations in Europe, um, I mean, this is a US site anyway. But if you're in Europe, absolutely um, tell people that they're interacting with an AI. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, it, so, so it asks us, hi, how you, are you looking for a job? And then you have uh, well, two buttons, find a job, ask a question, and uh, the, the box where you can actually type. Yes. It's I'm, interesting because... Go on, you're probably going to say no, the same thing that I am. Because <laughs> uh, 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 um, um, in my opinion, in, in the design, that, that is a, a root cause of a lot of problems. Yeah. Uh, and an, an annoyance with customers like, okay, you give me a choice, but I can do two things. So should I type the question and type a message or what do you want from me? Yeah. And I think it's either buttons or uh, a box where you can type. Um, but if you give me both, I get confused and I'm going to do stuff you don't want me to do. A hundred percent. So, so that would be my first piece of feedback as well is, you know, you're giving too many options here, but actually take that one step further. And if I'm up being asked a job, I, I, being asked a question, are you looking for a job? I would expect two, ans two answers to be given to me, yes or no, because it is a yes or no question. Um, and so I'm not being even, even given those options. So again, I would think about, um, I would think about that first experience, which is, are you looking for a job? It's a yes, no question. Um, you're not but being asked what kind no. of job are you looking for, you know, or anything like that. So. Yeah, but if you're you're if if you're going to the recruitment page and you're in the recruiter chatbot and you're not looking for a job, then it's interesting. Um, what other way can recruiters, uh, as a recruitment team, how can we help you? Mm. Um, or they obviously come for something else. Um, but you know what I would be interested in mm -hmm. if we type something completely off topic yeah. to see if there's a LLM behind it and. Uh, um, sort of steering us back or giving us a weird answer. Um, so basically a question like, where's the lion? Yeah, yeah, I, I was going to suggest that. There, there was one other thing that I wanted to point out, which is, again, I see so many times in recruitment chatbots. So I've gone onto a career page. Um, the first thing that is always served up to me is a search bar for a job. So w my question is, why would somebody open up a chatbot to search for a job when there is a job search bar there? So again, as the, as the recruiter, um, I would think about the experience. And again, there's too many options. So I would either say, look, you know, if you want people to search for a job on your career site, let them do that, but remove the, the, the function for searching up a chatbot, because why would you want to do, why would you open up a chatbot purely to search for a job when there's a big search bar there? Or get rid of the search bar and have everyone do it on the chatbot. Well, yeah, then there's another reason why I would remove the search bar. Exactly. Um, if you're looking for employees and you get them into a conversation, um, that's heaven. You can mm. engage. Yeah. And when you have engagement, you have a higher chance of getting people. And if they're just in the search bar, they might leave you and you would never be able to talk to them, get their information, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. So exactly. Yeah, I, I, would, I would not have a search bar. So, but make the chatbot as amazing as possible exactly. to make it as easy as possible. Exactly. You know, you can even embed the chatbot into the page rather than having it as a pop-up, you know, so there's no yeah, reason. I agree. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to type something random in here, like, um, tell me about the MGM line. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Right. Current. So I've typed in. Tell me about the MGM line. So, so as we said earlier, um, the question was, are you looking for a job? And the options were search for a job or ask a question. And then there was a field to put in free text. So rather than clicking the buttons, we went into the free text, typed in, tell me about the MGM line. And what came out was a response from the chatbot, which is current MGM resort employees should visit my MGM or talk to managers for additional information with a question, was this helpful with a thumbs up and a thumbs down? There's definitely no AI behind this. This is intents and utterances and they, they have, uh, this was, this probably had a low score, but they presented it anyway in the automated uh, yeah. process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm still not sure that fallback is appropriate. Um, it's not. No. And, and, it, and it asks, was this helpful with a thumbs up or a thumbs down, which is good to ask, but, um, um, that, and that probably is related to the score it got in the back end. Uh, they're not sure. And they're, they're, 
and that they should have said that in the beginning when, you know, we'll, we might ask you yeah. if something was helpful, that that's in order to help us train the bot to be better. Well, exactly. I mean, the, 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 the conversational error professional in me hopes that on a regular basis, um, you know, the team are going in and having a look at where all the thumbs down were and, and doing some kind of retraining. Um, so I, I'm going to put thumbs down and, uh, I'm, well, it says thank you for your feedback when I've clicked the thumbs down. Um, but I, that's actually well done in the, yeah. in the bot that it changes the the text. Yeah, so that was nice. Kudos for that. But then comes the next one, which is really weird. Here are a few questions that might be relevant for you. So this is this is just a, a you know this this is them attempting to to bring people back onto um, onto the conversation. So here are a few questions that might be relevant for you. And there's three questions. I'm a current employee, and I have a question. My question is not being answered. What type of jobs do you have open? So that might be relevant for you. So that, so I think here, again, this is a bit of a fallback to try and push people onto some kind of conversation path. Um, but it's not relevant, even though they're saying it's relevant for you, because I've asked originally, tell me about the MGM line. And, and actually, yeah. I think rather than it just being a tongue in cheek, let's, let's try and break the bar. It's actually quite a relevant question. Um, because it's quite a famous line. It's at the beginning of films, it's in the resorts, all those kind of things. You might want to know about it. You might just land it's it. A, it's and, even in their logo. It's in the logo. It is literally everything to do with their organization. So there's probably quite an interesting story behind it. And, and so I think that asking a question like that is quite relevant and should actually provide it, the experience that you could give to people to say, Oh, you know, um, all of our new employees get a picture with the line as well or something. You know, you just don't know what could come out of there. But it's uh, it's an opportunity, again, to engage and to delight. But um, these questions, um, here are a few questions that might be relevant for you. Um, well, they're not, they're not questions anyway. Um, yeah, but, but, but here's the thing. If you, if the first one is, I'm a current employee and I have a question and have a question, mm. then the second one should be, I'm not an employee, mm. but... Um, I have a question that needs to be answered or, um, I'm interested in working at MGM resorts. Yeah. Um, and it's, 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 it's comparing apples. It's putting apples and pears. It's a Dutch saying, yeah. uh, but it, it doesn't make sense to put that together. No. Um, so there's no logic there and it's my opinion. At least. No, but the interesting thing is, is that I'm a current employee and I have a question. I'm not sure why a current employee would, well, I can think of why a current employee might be on the careers site, but I wonder whether it. Well, just click it. Yeah, let's, let's, let's click it. I'm a current employee and I have a question. Okay. Oh, interesting enough, the menu disappears. Mm. That's it annoying. Oh, back. it comes back. Okay, so it gives you current MGM resort employees should visit my MGM or talk to managers for additional information. I think there should be a, a hyperlink um, to take you to my MGM. Um, but you can also call us for more assistance, um, which I would hope goes through to obviously HR or something like that. Um, was this helpful? Uh, again, a thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, I really hope that it doesn't ask that every time it throws a response. We'll have to have a look at that because, um, so let's try yeah. the next one. So here are a few questions that might be relevant for you. And it's exactly the same three questions, by the way. So again, it then yeah. says, okay, I've answered your question, which tells me where to go to as a current employee. Here are a few questions that might be relevant for you. And it then serves up exactly the same three questions. I'm a current employee with a question. My question is not being answered. What type of jobs do you have open? So I'm That's why my question is not being answered because um, um, it might go into another fallback scenario. Exactly. Or does it understand if that happens and you can't answer it, you need to go to a live chat or yeah. uh, ask my details, hopefully, and then uh, um, you will contact me. Let's see where it takes us. I'm hitting my question is not being answered. Drum roll. Da, 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 da. Oh my God. Okay, we're sorry to hear this. If you need more assistance or if there is anything we can do to make your experience with us better, please reach out to us by clicking the button below. We encourage internal employees to contact your manager or HR for potential resolution. It's interesting they keep pushing calling us. back to in internal employees. Because I, apparently, my... couldn't it be that they, they've had so many employees could, that could, probably couldn't reach anyone and tried the external bot to get to, to someone? Yeah, they... it's, but it's it's still interesting because I would almost, if that's the case, I would almost ask for a profiling question at the beginning and say, <clears throat> are you a current employee of MGM? 
or I just you, go to my MGM. Yeah, or, or even give them a whole different experience through the chat. Yeah, you know, because you you then yeah. you then know who they are to you know know what kind of a person you are. Um, but it's interesting that I'm an external candidate looking for a job at MGM Resorts, and yet all of the responses that I've had make reference to being an internal employee. I mean, I granted that's only the last half of this answer. Um, yeah, and we're sorry to hear hear that your question is not being answered. If you need more assistance, or if there is anything we can do to make your experience a better, please reach out just by clicking the button below. The button below is. And what happens us. if what contact us? What happens? Okay, so we are taken to a different tab, which is literally just a contact us tab on MGM Resorts. Not even the careers have to contact the careers. Not a, and not a email box or something where you can no email box oh. no live chat uh, this is literally just how this is a missed opportunity it's a really missed opportunity because i was on the career site why can i not be put in touch with the careers team hr hr yeah. recruitment i'm being literally just given how to contact mgm resorts international um, that's some amazing amazing hotels although amazing hotels there. yeah i've been to a the couple Bellag yeah. Bellagio. Come on. Yeah, and the area. I have my honeymoon in the area, actually. Um, so uh, there we go. Uh, I really don't want to know. <laughs> don't worry, I was very well behaved. Um, so let's go back to the. Uh, let's go back to yeah. the bot anyway. So again, we on the answer. One last helpful. option to go. Yeah, and they're asking they're again. They're asking if uh, at least they had the yeah. thumbs up, thumbs down. So uh, that almost uh, makes that's interesting. Yeah, they, but they it almost makes me feel like the, the, the chatbot's got a complex. Yeah, you know, because if I was a human. <laughs> And every time I, I gave, I, I said something to somebody and I said, oh, were you happy with what I said? I mean, the, the, that, that would be something that I'd need to go to a, to a therapist about. It, this is, uh, yeah. I was going to say, you're very uncertain. Yeah. Uh, here are a few questions might be relevant for you. Same three questions again. So let's well, let's the last try one. the last one. What type we of have no choice, have right? We want to personalize your job recommendations to find out the right job. We need to know more about your background and interests. Would you like to upload your resume or answer questions? Wow. Okay. Let's go to answer questions. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, we're jumping from first to third date pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. What's your preferred job title? Ah, uh, I will put down a, oh, look at this. This is interesting. That's actually well done. Yeah. So I typed yeah. in Bard. So just for the people that can't see this. It asked me, what was your preferred job title? We'll try finding similar jobs. And I typed in bartender and it actually then served up a, a list of different, a list of, of, of results. Functions. Yeah, of options. So bartender. These are the functions they have in their hotels. I mean, potentially. Um, well, let's just go yeah. for bartender manager, see what happens. Okay. I think this is well done. Yeah, that was nice. That was very nice. I wonder whether if I was to have typed in something that wouldn't be in an MGM hotel, like astronaut, what it would have done. Um, I should have tried did that. Did you notice, by the way, Martin, did you notice, by the way, that in the typing box, which should be for us, it says the bot is typing. Yes. That means you can't, you can't put anything in there. That, no. that is also well done in can't order to not mess up the bot. Yeah. No, and I can't, I can't, I can't um, select that box at all. Um, we still got three dots going on. It's still thinking. Notice there's a, I'm, I presume this hamburger is a menu. I, I'll click on that soon and see what's in there as well. It takes a long time. Yeah, this is um, this isn't as fast as I'd expect. And actually, I might then after the bot just type in bartender manager um, and see if it, how quickly the uh, the job search on the page works because this is taking a long time. This is, um, and that's, yeah, there's no way to interrupt it, right? There's no way of interrupting it without just closing it down. And I don't know. I don't, I don't even know if we said interrupted. The... Pardon? I don't think it's interrupted then. Maybe you can refresh the, refresh the page, see what happens. I'd be interested to see what happens actually. Let me refresh the page. <clears throat> There it is. It's pulsing. I don't know if that means that I'm supposed to click on it. Let's have a look. Ah. It has a heartbeat. Would you like to ask questions next? Oh, it's, it's 
it's so it's gone back it's into the back. conversation, but it's almost forgotten the last answer, which is bartender. Um, and I wanted to find out. Oh look, um, I wanted to find out what that hamburger was. It's still the persistent menu from the first interaction. Um, uh, that's what it's all about. Yeah, they they have only that. So they've got two paths: find a job or ask a question. And the ask a question wasn't yeah. very good anyway. Um, okay, so it came up with a search answer for bartender. I I selected bartender manager, and it seemed to break it. Get, um, get stuck. Get stuck. So. I'm going to I'm going to see what happens. Like I said, if I put in something like astronaut, <laughs> it has it as an option. <clears throat> oh my goodness! Um, you know, you know, you know this. The, the, um, you know the in the old days we used monster board and that kind of. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, maybe 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 it's still around. I don't use it, but yeah. Um, um, you had these functions lists. Uh, I'm not sure if astronauts was one of them, but it, it looks like they used one of those lists of all the functions like you could it. have yeah. in any company. Give, give me a list of every job title that's ever existed anywhere. Uh, unless it's connected to movies. <laughs> and MGM is all about movies. So do you know what I want to do? That could be as well. I want to click on it and see what happens. But, but yeah, go, I, mean, I want to be an astronaut at MGM Resorts. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Great. Oh, my God, it's actually answered. Great. Where do you want to work? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> oh, this is brilliant. I'm going to be, I'm going to be an astronaut at MGM Results. Where do you want to work? Well, I, look, I know that this is an American um, site, so I'm not going to put in Sleepy St. Albans in Hertfordshire in the UK, where I am right now. But I'm going to type in Las Vegas because, look, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try and play it that much. But I, wa I want to be an astronaut at, um, at, at the Bellagio no, in no, no, no. Las Vegas. So uh, let's see what happens. Oh, I can add in multiple locations. That's interesting. Uh, can I have Florida? I don't know. Florida. I don't know what. Uh, Cuba. There we go. Let's see what happens there. And then I've got a send button. This is interesting. So this has changed the kind of interaction slightly. Um, so rather than saying where do I want to work and me just kind of you know, selecting a location, I can now create a list of options. Um, you know, maybe I can put down London. There we go, United Kingdom. Um, so I've now given it three options, London, Florida, and Cuba, and Las Vegas. If you're an astronaut, it makes perfect sense. You just, you know, in the atmosphere, you just travel drop, around. Drop in wherever I want to be. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So it's changed the interaction. So it's no longer kind of text or anything like that. So it's now just a search. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. send the results. Um, I'm really curious. I'm really curious now. Got it. So Thanks. it says London, greater... London, United Kingdom, Florida, Cuba, <laughs> Las Vegas, Nevada, United States. Yeah. So, okay. so I want to work in, in London, UK, in Florida, in Cuba, and Vegas. In this Nevada. is hilarious. So I got this it. So, so the, the bot then says, got it, thanks. And then it processes it and says, thanks. Here are your job recommendations based on the information provided me. So, so what it served me up is, is 20 options on a carousel, um, card options on a carousel. Yeah, but the first one is... first is, one is a master cook for sushi in, in the area in Vegas. Um, but it, nothing's doing would, would that still be as an astronaut? You'd be, you'd be cooking sushi or cooking, making sushi in space? I don't know. Um, I mean, it's given me, like I said, two of 20. Well, so 20 options. So now I've got a gatekeeper, a computer engineer, a lead engineer, senior manager network support and operations, and it goes on. Senior VP of financial planning. My goodness. All astronauts. Hotel shop engineer. But there's no astronauts. Um, so, look, you know, I mean, we, we, we can have some fun with this, but I'm not going to. I mean, look, you know, if I put in I'm interested, um, this is interesting. So concierge New York, New York is the job title. Um, oh, I, actually, no, there's a, um, there's a hotel called New York. Uh, New York, isn't there? I'm just remembering that. Um, Probably. There is. Um, so anyway, it's from the song, I think. No, I, I was actually uh, thinking. I wonder why the job's in New York, but they're saying it's in Vegas. But it wasn't. It's, I was obviously at the hotel, New York, New York. Um, so I'm going to hit. I'm interested. I need to see the rest of the experience. But look, let's yeah. just summarise where we're up to. I said I wanted to, I wanted a job as an astronaut, and it gave me the option of selecting that. Which, I mean, we can say straight away, don't give me an option unless it's actually an option, um, because because that. 
it's going to provide a bad experience because granted nobody's going to come on here and say i want to be an astronaut but if they came on here and said i want to be a marketing director and mgm results uh, resorts don't hire marketing directors tell us that say that's not an option um, at mgm results well don't even give it as an option you know um or, or just rather than have that was a really nice experience having the search list come up but if your search list is 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 not um, relevant to your organization, then maybe we need to think about not having the search list and just having some kind of um, um, semantic matching that happens in the background to say, okay, we'll just type in what job, ask the question, what would you like to do next? What job would you like and, to do next? And take and that. And these jobs are in a database anyway. So. All those jobs are in the database, you should be able to match it to relevant roles. It's not difficult at all. Um, so I think that, I think that whilst that searching and selection was a really nice experience, once we actually put something in that was almost ludicrous and it allowed us to continue with that past. experience, yeah, it, the experience breaks. Um, Let's try I'm interested because um, yeah. I'm interested to see what happens. So I'm interested in being a concierge in the Hotel New York, New York. I'm interested. As yes. an astronaut. Um, we have a few questions about your background experience to get your application started. What's your full name? So... Um, uh, 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 Buzz Lightyear, Buzz. Oh yeah, no, uh, we can definitely do you're that. A, yeah, uh, Buzz Lightyear. You're an astronaut. I'm an astronaut, right? Uh, these people on the other end, they're gonna okay, gonna be laughing. Thanks, Buzz. Yeah, <laughs> nice to meet. Thanks, Buzz. Nice to meet you, Buzz. What's the best email address or phone number to reach you on? Um, so, um, Buzz Buzz at spacemail dot com. Spacemail <laughs> Um, I love it. What's the best email address or number to reach you on? Or, or buzz at nasa.com. Oh, yeah, buzz at, at nasa.gov would be, wouldn't it? Um, uh, <laughs> there we go. We're probably in trouble for this. Oh, probably, but okay. probably. But let's, let's just go for it. I'll blame you. Um, I'm okay. <laughs> and what's That's your best email? So this is interesting. Thanks, Buzz. Nice to meet you, Buzz. What's your best email address or phone number to reach you? We will only contact you for potential job opportunities. Hang on. Hang on, I'm applying for a job. So why are you saying that you're only going to contact me for potential job opportunities? Surely you're collecting my email address make so that you can communicate yeah. with me about the job that I'm applying for, not potential job opportunities. So again, think about the language that's being used. Um, that's not setting my expectations very well. No. Um, so buzz at nasa.gov. So they have no connection between the, the fact w that you chose a, a function where you're interested and mm. the answer. And again, do you want to opt in to receive job-related email campaigns and direct messages for us? I'll just say yes. So this is yeah. marketing, really. Okay, so thanks for your interest in this job, Buzz. You don't need to keep... Okay, so this is actually quite annoying. I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know if it's a personal thing, but I recognize that you've got my name. Thanks, Buzz. You don't need to use it in every interaction now. Um, you've got my name. You could then say, nice to meet you. You don't need to repeat my name. And then further down, you don't even need to say, thanks for your interest in this job, Buzz. It's like it's like that, um, that annoying estate agent, every room you go into says, oh, you know, this is the kitchen, Martin. This is the lounge, Martin. Like you. I know what my name is. You don't need to repeat it to me. It, be, it becomes intrusive. Yes. Um, it's almost like they're trying too hard to be personal. Um, okay, so the next... Well, they failed in the other part, so they have to yeah. you know, be successful somewhere. Yeah. So thanks for your interest in this job, Buzz. The next step is to submit your application. Apply now. And it's taken me... To space. <laughs> taken me to another tab. Let's have a look what is happening here. Ah, oh, God. Humans were not meant to be bored. Welcome to the show. Okay, so then... this, okay, so I can tell you what's happened here. So the chatbot is on. Well, we have to explain what we're seeing. Yeah. So there's this banner. It says humans were not meant to be bored. Welcome to the show. And the show is underlined. So it's probably hyperlink. Nope. I don't know. I can't. No, nope. not a hyperlink. Not a hyperlink. No. Nope. So it's just 
typo, typo yeah. typography. Yeah. And then it says sign in, email address, password, sign in. You, you don't have an account yet, create account. But I'm not sure what I'm creating an account for. Well, exactly. That's the interesting, that's why I just went, oh my God, it's just, so first of all, okay. Um, so so as, as a, a recruitment technology professional, I can tell you what's happened here. Um, there is a, a, um, a piece of software in the background where the chatbot is um, that's probably something like a candidate relationship management tool. Um, and I think I know who the vendor is. I'm not going to say it out loud, but I think I know who the vendor is based on that chat experience. Um, and when I'm ready to apply for the job, it's then handed me over to the, the web, um, the web functionality of the applicant tracking system, which we can see from the, um, from the URL bar is workday. Um, okay. and, um, workday, um, is a very large you know, piece of software. Um, but unfortunately I don't believe that they've got a very good recruitment experience because you need to site, you need to create an account with them in order to actually apply for a job, which is just a terrible experience. The experience you should tell me what are you going to do with my data before I make an account? Well, exactly. Um, you know, and, and, and the, like you said, it doesn't even say here, you know, create an account to apply for the job, which is exactly what the, I'm being asked to do, but nobody's actually asking me to do it. It's just brought me to a page that says MGM resort doc. Search the chatbot is gone, corner. by the way. Pardon? The chatbot didn't move to that. The chatbot page. didn't move to this web page. Um, I hit apply for the apply for the job on the chatbot. I kind of expect the the um, the application experience to continue on the chatbot um, rather than take me off to a different platform. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm not going to go any further than this. But I would then, even if you you can't cope with the application experience on the chatbot, you need to hand me off. For goodness sake, have something here that says create an account in order to apply for a job. I mean, I don't really want to create an account to apply for a job. Nobody does. Um, so this is where we see a massive drop off in, um, yeah. in in conversion numbers, to be honest with you, because who wants to do this? You know, it's ridiculous. And they're ready to drop off is where in the chatbot where you said you wanted to be an astronaut yes. at MGM and they tell you to be a, a sushi chef, sushi chef yeah. or a concierge or whatever. It makes no sense. No. Um, Thank you. I think we're, we're, we're done with uh, testing. We've seen what we wanted to see. Um, um, th there's a few good elements, in my opinion, in the bot. Um, but a lot of it is, it's not the voice of the brand, mm. to be honest. It's, at MGM, I would have expected something big and with grandeur and, yeah. and, and the lion. Um, I, and and it's, it's lacking. Even just a simple GIF, right? Or GIF or however they pronounce it nowadays, where if I say I want to apply for this job, have the Bellagio fountains coming up or something just, just, just to show that kind of grandeur of being part of something like MGM resorts. It's, you know, yeah. Or thank you for, for being part of the, wanting to be part of the MGM yeah. family. Yeah. Um, we're honored or, you know, whatever, we're delighted. Yeah. Um, if, if we're, we're, we're coursing towards the end of the podcast, mm. um, if you would give one or two tips to people, um, trying to get, you know, trying to start with conversational AR in AR, AI in HR, sorry. Um, what would you tell them? What would be the advice? And uh, that's for people working in our field. And at the same time for companies that would do want to want to apply conversational AI in their recruitment or HR field. It's a good question. So, so, so um, without doing myself out of business, I think for people in our field, um, I think it's pretty obvious that um, people need help designing really good experiences. So help them is all I'm going to say. You know, I think, I think people in our field, there's a great opportunity to, um, to impart that experience and that knowledge in conversation design on such an important experience in people's lives that that's what we should be doing. And that's, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what I do as well. Um, on the and and on the side of recruiters that want to start utilizing conversational on their process think about and i say this anyway so so i always say to recruiters go and apply for a job on your website you know but <laughs> think about just you know where you think the experience drops and and what have you and it's the same you know if you're going to start creating a, a career site chatbot um don't just plug and play, which is look, which looks like what's happened here. Uh, you know, tell us, you know, give us your colors and your logo and we'll do the rest. 
you know, think about the experience. Think about, like I said, your your employer brand. You know, think about what you're trying to get across in in an experience with a with with the career site because you have probably spent a lot of time, a lot of money developing and designing your employer brand and how that looks on your website. Don't let it drop on your chatbot. Um, and I say this all the time. You know, think of your chatbot as the new website. You know. 20 years ago, people were building websites, they're letting IT do it, and the experience was terrible. You know, think of chatbots as that. You know, you're, do, you're doing the same thing. Fast forward 20 years later, you're bringing in UX experts into build your, your and UI experts to build your, um, build your website. Um, do the same for chatbots as well. Don't just leave it up to either somebody internally to just plug and play a chatbot. Don't even just leave it leave it up to your your preferred vendor um bring in somebody who knows how to create a great experience for your for your job seekers your candidates your applicants so the conclusion is for everybody don't be afraid to ask for help of a professional exactly exactly i think that's a, a fair advice actually it usually it costs money but in the end it saves the money because the you get a better result. I mean, there's some very, very, I'm, I'm hoping that somebody from MGM is watching this at some point and they'll see that there's some very, very easy quick fixes to probably increase your conversion rates very, very quickly and very rapidly. Thank you very, very much, Martin. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And um, I think uh, MGM uh, can, can do their or have an advantage by listening to our podcast and uh, improving their, uh, their chatbot. Uh, thank you very much for, for being on the show and sharing your knowledge. Thanks for inviting me, John. It's been great. Um, really, really, really good uh, opportunity to go through it. And I look, you know, just to take what you said, I hope that anybody that's got a recruitment chatbot is watching the podcast and is going to go and try and make some improvements. There's not just MGM. Um, but I hope, I hope um, yeah, it's been a really good, really good session. Thank you. Thank you very much.